Welcome to our 87th show of Start Our Sabbath. Thank you for joining us. You could have been doing something else tonight, but you chose to be with us, and we want to tell you how much we appreciate that you tuned in to SOS. That's right. Nancy's right. You could have been doing something fun tonight instead of tuning into our show. Wait a minute. Our show's fun. Oh, yeah. I forgot. Okay. All right. Sorry we had a no show last week, but as you know, Wes and I, Wes... And I attended a women's conference with the Church of God Seventh Day here in Tyler, Texas. Yeah, and it was great. It was really well put together. A lot of thought and hard work went into this women's conference. And Wes was the only guy allowed there. He got invited because I wanted him to play guitar. But then he got kicked out during the sessions after the music was over. Yeah, and I got to tell you, this thing was so well put together. It was really well organized. The presentations were great. And don't tell anyone, but they did... A Spanish to English translation, and that's not the secret part. The secret part is I got to listen to the whole thing in the lobby with my translation headphones. That you, was so cool. You are so sneaky. Yeah, and, and get this. They had over 70 women present out here in Hillbilly Land in East Texas. They got 70 women uh, to attend this conference. Another uh, thing that was nice was it was absolutely free. No one right. had to pay to get in. No one had to pay for food. The conference and the food were absolutely free. And the women had done a bunch of fundraisers so they could provide a free That's conference. That's right. And during the sessions, while I was banned from the room, they called me in when it was time to play music. But during the sessions, they kicked me out. I got to eat pizza. I had a great time at the women's conference. Yeah, they wanted to feed you their great Mexican food, but you ate your pizza. I love, I love pizza. And it really says something that Wes had a great time because he's such a grump. Whoa, well, wait, where did that come from? Let me illustrate. I want to show all our viewers what a grump you are. Grump? What are you talking about? Me, a grump? Last week we babysat our one of our neighbor's cats, and now you'll oh. now you say you'll never allow a cat into our home again. Oh man, you had to go there. Had to go there. Uh, yeah, yeah, all right. If she wants to talk about it, let's talk about it. Our neighbor, Mrs. Mindelbright, left town for a week, and she asked if we could watch her cat while she was on vacation. And Mrs. Mindelbright said to us, she said, If you really like my cat, you can keep her, because I already have five other cats. Yeah, she's a neighborhood cat lady. Yeah, and don't eat any food that gets made in Mrs. Mindelbright's house Unless you don't mind getting a hairball, okay? Yeah, the truth. Yeah. Uh, and I thought, great, we finally get to have a pet in our house. Well, yeah, so we're babysitting this cat, and we're thinking, we're actually, what was I thinking? We're thinking about adopting it. He was so cute. Now, get this. This cat wakes me up early every morning, meowing me to death because he wants to go outside. Mm -hmm. So I drag myself out of bed. I open the back door so he can go outside and he just sits there. He can't quite make up his mind whether he wants to go out or if he wants to stay inside. Yeah, he was a very indecisive cat when it came to going outside or staying inside. So I'm standing there in my pajamas, half asleep, 
with the door open, watching this cat be all indecisive. And finally, I have enough of it. So I gently, I, I didn't push him, didn't kick him. I gently pick him up, gently put him outside. And guess what? He gets mad at me. He's sitting outside glaring at me. And tell them what happened next. Oh, okay. All right. At that point, I named that cat Brexit. <laughs> Get it? Brexit? Can't make up his mind if he wants to stay or go. And now please don't go into one of your Brexit rants. Well, well, it's such a mess over there in Britain these days, over there supposedly leaving the European Union. The Brits did not think this decision through. Their decision to leave was like this knee-jerk reaction. It's like this. Here's, here's what happened. The UK got drunk and accidentally unfriended Europe on Facebook. Same thing. <laughs> and, and some of you out there know what I'm talking about, so don't be all disapproving. All right, can we please move on from that? As a result of this mess in Britain over there leaving or not leaving the EU, Brexit is now a new verb in the English language. So when people say Brexit today, it has nothing to do with Europe. Today, Brexit is when you're at a party and you want to leave but you're not sure how to make your exit, so you spend four hours trying to figure out how to gracefully leave. That's called Brexit. All right, well, we've got a great show for you. I am not done yet. You know, I long for the simpler days when Brexit was just a term when it was time for you to leave brunch. You know, brunch, <laughs> exit, All right. exit. Yeah, That's yeah. enough, All okay? Right. As always, a lot of people have put a lot of work into tonight's show. That's right. We don't just show up uh, Friday evening here in the studio for us to say, oh, what are we going to talk about this evening? We actually start writing each show the Sunday before. Or sometimes earlier in that. Yeah. Yeah, we have emails going back and forth all week. Bill and Wes and I are in regular communication throughout the week, and we're regularly reviewing each other's material. And Bill's always trying to steal material from me. Bill does not do any such thing. Well, there's a fine line between plagiarism and stealing ideas. Fine line. Oh, really? And where did you get the idea for your Wednesday night uh, youth devotional that you did for the kids in the Tyler Church of God Seventh Day? Last Wednesday night, Tyler Church of God Seventh Day youth devotional. Oh, you mean the devotional I did with the kids about uh, being fascinated by things so you can learn things? That's the one. Yeah, I guess I got that from Bill. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. <laughs> oh, okay. As always, we want to thank the others who contribute to this show every week. Absolutely. How could we do this show without the help of Carl and Mimi? Yes, two very capable and two very lovable people. Uh-huh. They are lovable. They have to be to put up with your antics. What does that say about you? Obviously, it says I'm lovable. Oh, I walked right into that you one. You did didn't indeed. I? <laughs> so thank you, lovable Carl and Mimi. Yeah, we really appreciate their hard work. It's interesting that other shows from religious organizations don't talk much about the people who work behind the scenes. Have you ever seen some of the people who work behind the scenes of these other shows? Don't you dare go there. Trust me, you do not want to mention these people on the air. I think you're wrong. I think these, I think these behind the scenes people don't get mentioned because a typical show has many, many people involved in its production. You're probably right. There are only six people involved in SOS. That's all it takes to put the show on. There's Bill, Terry, Mimi, Carl. You and me. That's right. And speaking of Terry, we want to send out a big thank you to Southern California where Terry is busy helping Bill uh, become a part of the show. Yeah, but Nancy's so right. It's kind of miraculous to me. It's kind of miraculous how Terry, when she produces Bill's segment, she's able to bring it onto the show every week. I don't know how this works. Yeah, well, it happens because of Terry's special talents when it comes to technical expertise. What's Bill's technical expertise? Does Bill have any technical expertise? Well, I can't believe you just said that. <laughs> oh, that came out wrong. What I mean is Bill's talents are in other areas. Oh, yeah, like talk, 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 talk. All talk. right. After after all this, I'd be surprised if Bill even shows up for tonight's SOS Trust program. me, Bill can't stay away from a microphone. Bill will be here tonight. Don't get mad, Bill. He says the same thing about me. Yes. We've got a great show for you tonight. Bill is going to talk about dirty feet. Nancy's going to talk about horseshoes and hand grenades. And Wes is going to talk about one of the biggest dangers to small group Bible studies, and it's not food coming from people with cats. No, no, wait, wait, what, what about the topic of taking the bread and the cup unworthily? Weren't we supposed to cover that tonight? 1 Corinthians eleven twenty seven. Yes, we were, but then we realized that we already covered this extensively in SOS 48. Yes. So instead of covering 1 Corinthians eleven twenty seven on tonight's show, we're going to provide you with the YouTube link 
for SOS 48, where we explain what it means to take the bread and cup unworthily. Yeah, this link uh, is going to be, I don't know if it's out there yet, but it's going to be in both of our chat rooms, so check it out. If you have any problems accessing SOS 48 with the link we're going to provide tonight, let us know. We want to make sure there is no confusion regarding this business of taking the bread and the cup unworthily. This is a very misunderstood scripture, so please make sure that you understand it. If you're having a conflict in your mind, or another person you know is having a conflict regarding taking the bread and the cup uh, unworthily, check out SOS number 48. You need to understand this. And remember, if you subscribe to our YouTube channel and the RLDEA YouTube channel, you will never miss a new episode or video. That's right. So for right now, let's start with prayer. Let's open. Okay. Our Father in Heaven, we are so grateful to you and we celebrate your Sabbath tonight because we love your Sabbath. We thank you for giving it to us. We thank you that Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath. We thank you that he is our Savior. He's our King. He sits at your right hand. He intervenes for us. Now, Father, please help us to do a good show tonight. Please bless everything that's said and done and help us to do this to your glory. Sure, we have a lot of fun on this show. That's only secondary. What we primarily want to do is, is uh, shut, let our light shine so that we can glorify you. So help us to glorify you tonight. Uh, help all of us in the chat room. Help us all to better understand your word and have love for one another. So we commit this show, we commit our lives to you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Okay. Uh, thank, uh, let's see, uh, oh, oh, we're going to take a quick commercial break. Okay. Okay, let's do that now. We really are. <laughs> the Apostle Paul made a simple yet disturbing statement about suffering. He wrote a letter to the church in the city of Corinth and told them that for the cause there are many among them who are weak and sick. And Paul said that a number of them had died. We find this in Corinthians 11.30. If you were in the church of Corinth at that time, no doubt you would have wondered about this cause that Paul mentioned. You would have no doubt looked around the congregation and reminisced about the people who had once been part of your congregation. You would remember that there were people who had gotten sick. The church had prayed for them, and yet they didn't get well. They died. Doesn't Paul's letter make you want to understand more about this cause that he writes about? Well, Paul makes it clear that the cause was directly related to the suffering of Jesus Christ, his scourging, his crucifixion. At the Ronald L. Dart Evangelistic Association, we have a message that goes into detail about how the cause directly affects us today and how it relates to the suffering of Jesus. This cause is not something that only affected those who lived during the life of Paul. We are experiencing the same problem today, where we see sick people who, even after prayer, do not get better. Instead, they die. At RLDEA.com, we have a message entitled, Why Christ Had to Suffer. You can find this message on the audio recordings tab of our website, RLDEA.com. The message is free. Again, the title is, Why Christ Had to Suffer, at RLDEA.com. Thank you, Gary Gibbons, for that uh, wonderful message. And thank you, uh, Carl, who puts together the audio for our, all our commercials. By the way, we're doing something different tonight in the way that we have posted this out on uh, Facebook. And, uh, and if, if you're having any problems or see something that's not working quite right, let us know in the chat room because this is an experiment we're doing tonight to increase our uh, outreach to uh, a bigger audience. And if you're having any problems with any of this, let us know. But so far, it looks like everything's working. Nobody's seeing anything in the chat room. Uh, and no one said it's not working. We did post the link, so check those out and let us know. That, that's and the link. That's a whole different thing. And we've thing. got a bunch of, well, could they see it? Uh, we've got all of our fans here, so I think we've got the same people okay. following us. So it seems okay. No one's commenting that they're having trouble. All right. Well, if you are, let us know, okay, because we, uh, we're trying something different tonight to uh, see if we can reach out okay, and Okay, so you just audience. have it on this. So do you want us on the... Oh. Yes, thank you. Okay. <laughs> okay, uh, there we all go. All right, uh, let's get into our first segment tonight. Uh, what have you got for us this evening, sweetheart? Okay, well, you know, when I was in my uh, late 30s, I worked as a teacher's aide in the local junior high. 
and I was surprised by the number of times some child would rudely ask how old I was. I can only assume that my age in their minds was germane to my ability to help them with schoolwork. And I would always respond with, what do you think? Then whatever they guessed, and believe me, their guesses ranged from like 30 to 60. 30 if they were trying to impress me, 60 if they were trying to try and get my goat. I'd say, close enough. There's an old saying, you know, that says close only counts in hand grenades and horseshoes. And I suppose it also counts if you're trying to guess my age. But as a Christian, is close enough ever good enough? Before we tackle that question, let's consider the target we're supposed to hit. We find uh, the, the Christian's target in Matthew 5:48. I want to look at it from three translations. So first, the ESV translation. There, uh, you, therefore, must uh, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. The New Living Translation puts it like this. But you are to be perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. The King James Version says, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven, uh, which is in heaven, is perfect. Now, can we all agree that in these different translations, it is clear that our target is to become just as perfect as our Heavenly Father? Raise your hands if you agree. Okay, I can't see your hands, but I assume you do. That's a tough marker to hit, don't you think? Perfection, just as God is perfect. This admonition we're examining comes at the end of Matthew 5, a chapter that begins with the Beatitudes and follows with things that are even harder. Not only, uh, I'm going to give you a few examples. So the first one is, not only should you not murder, don't even call someone a fool. We'll start in verse 21. You have heard that it said of old, you shall not murder. And whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says you fool will be liable to the fire of hell. Now, number two, not only should you not swear falsely, but, even, but you should even be a person whose truthfulness cannot be questioned. Starting in verse 33 of uh, Matthew 5. Again, you have heard that it is said of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, don't even take an oath at all. Number three, not only should you not seek revenge, you should not even resist evil. That starts in verse 38. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if uh, anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. Number four, not only should you not hate your enemy, you must return good for evil. That starts in verse uh, 43. You have heard that it is said you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. These are some tough standards, but they are steps toward becoming perfect as our Father in heaven is perfect. One word translated sin in the New Testament is hermitano, which can be translated miss the mark. Another word translating sin, sin is very similar, hamartisha. It can also be translated miss the mark. So if sin is considered missing the mark, then close enough is not good enough for Christians. We know that perfection is simply not possible in this human mortal body. Only Jesus Christ himself ever achieved that when he was a human being uh, walking this earth. So, if nothing else other than perfection is acceptable and perfection is impossible, what is a Christian to do? Are we doomed to fa failure? Well, I have good news for us all. It's found in 1 John 2, verse 1 to 2. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is a propitiation for our sins, and not for us only, but for the sins of the whole world. The word translated sin in 1 John 2, 1 is one of our two Greek words that mean miss the mark. So if anyone misses the mark, we have Jesus as our advocate. In addition, we find the following in John 1.29. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him, and, toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This, trans, this word translated sin in 1 John 1.29 is another word that means miss the mark. 
So if anyone misses the mark, we have Jesus, the lamb that takes away our sin. You know, I'm a part-time and not very good archer. I use a traditional bow rather than a compound bow, uh, tar target arrows, not real arrows, and a big yellow target bag with a red bullseye on it. So I picture myself in my wide leg stance, two fingers holding the string taut on the bow at my jawline. I focus my eye on the target, point the arrow, take a deep <coughs> breath, exhale slowly, and let go. The arrow zings by the target and hits the dirt behind. Perhaps I wobbled at the last minute or didn't take into account the wind. Whatever the cause, I missed the mark by a long, long shot. Just then, Jesus steps over, plucks my arrow out of the ground, and jabs it right into the bullseye. I express my thanks, he smiles, and I keep trying to hit the target. Praise God that Jesus' blood covers the distance between my best shot and the actual bullseye we're called to hit. But we must never be content with close enough. We must always strive to get better every day when it comes to hitting the mark dead on. Scriptures like Matthew 5 help us to understand the path to that perfection we're called to try and hit. And so we keep working our way each day ever closer to perfection and with the assurance that Jesus covers the gap. I welcome your comments and questions and you can write me in the chat room right now or anytime after the show at nancy at dynamicchristianministries.org. Very good. Thank you, sweetheart. Uh, we're getting ready to go to our next segment here. As soon as I can get these controls working, let's get this going back here. Uh, we're, we're about ready to bring Bill on for his segment. You don't want to miss that. And remember that Bill uh, runs the Facebook page called Seventh Day Sabbath Keepers. Now, Seventh Day Sabbath Keepers has just gone over 28,000 followers. So congratulations, Bill. Uh, a bill, uh, because I mean, twenty-eight thousand is a huge number for a page like Seventh Day Sabbath Keepers. I have to ask the question: Do you know how many church organizations that are out there that have full-time staffs? They spend tons of money on their Facebook pages. They don't have anywhere near twenty-eight thousand followers like Bill does. So this is great stuff, and I recommend you check out Seventh Day Sabbath Keeper. Now, I have Bill all frozen on the screen here in a minute, and I'm a little worried I messed it up. So let's see if I can bring him onto the show, if I can press the and right. started back, or called back. Call him back. All right, let me redial him and get Bill back on here. Go. All right. Well, good evening, Wes and Nancy. Good evening, Bill. Are you getting ready for the Lord's Supper Passover? Uh, yes, I certainly am, and that's why I'm going to be talking about feet tonight. Feet, smelly feet, right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Because at this time of the year, feet are important. All right, let's hear about feet, Bill. <laughs> okay. You know, amongst the Sabbath-keeping community, the practice of foot washing at the communion service of the Lord's Supper has been a long-standing practice. And we're going to take a closer look at foot washing this evening as we approach this season. Now, I didn't grow up in the faith. Uh, I started listening to what was called then the World Tomorrow Broadcast, way back in 1972. And I was only 14 years old. I must have been a weird kid. I used to listen to KLAC radio at night, little headphone with transistor radio at 11 o'clock at night. But anyway, but I'm the only member in my family, and I started attending church when I was 17, and that's when I was baptized. And I was told that I was the youngest baptized person on the records in the church. And that time, they didn't want to baptize people that were minors. But because I had come into the church on my own, and I even did the old correspond Bible correspondence course that we used to have by hand, and put out all the answers on it, they said, hey, you can go ahead and be baptized. Now, one of the many requirements to being a believer, and I was aware of, aware of all of them, but frankly, the one I didn't want to do. No, it wasn't tithing, something like that. It was doing the ceremony of foot washing. That's what I didn't want to do. You see, I, I grew up in a really guy environment. I grew up in the inner city, and I was playing basketball and baseball, having rock fights, even real fights. Right? But washing another guy's feet, I mean, we didn't, as guys growing up, we didn't touch each other. Right? We didn't hug. It was a different era. 
Maybe you got a little pat on the rear end if you hit a home run or something, but or scored a touchdown. But touching another guy, touching another guy's feet? Oh man, yuck, yuck and ugh. <laughs> right. So it seemed like a very, very foreign idea to me. But I had made friends at church with another young man who had just come in just a couple months before me. Uh, his name was Jim Springer, and this was, well, I, I knew him for over 40 years before his untimely death. He stayed faithful for all that time, just a couple years ago. Very good friend. And I figured if I had to do this, I would try to arrange things so that I would at least do my friend's feet, my friend Jim. And Jim was, that was his first Passover uh, Lord's Supper as well. Uh, he wanted to do my feet. And he figured we, we could do each other. We'll at least put up with that, right? So we sat together, at, and we made the arrangement. We sat together at the service. And back then, there were up to a 1,000 people that would do the Lord's Supper event. And it was a major operation to pull this off in, in our congregation. And it took lots of people having to organize things and, and rotate the people in and out to take care of the water and take care of the seating and all the different things that were required to make this happen. It still took a, a quite a bit of time. So Jim and I got up and we were in the line waiting. And suddenly a deacon pointed at me. He says, you, you go over there. And then he said to Jim, he goes, you, you go over there. So there we were, we were separated. We were sent into a completely different direction. I, I was panic struck, right? And who did I get teamed up with? I was teamed up with a man from India. Okay, now I had never met a man from India before. I didn't realize this was a long time ago. This is back before America was as much multicultural as it is today. But he looked different. He had a dark beard and he wasn't all that fluent in English either. So I was a little bit intimidated by that and felt very insecure. So he sat down and it was my duty then to serve him first. And I was nervous, I was shy, I was scared. The gentleman just went and he took off his own shoes. I didn't even help. And he went and he took off his own socks. Again, I didn't know what to, what to do. And then he put his feet into the basin. And you know what? I'm embarrassed to say, I, I didn't even touch his feet, right? I, I just kind of splashed some water at it, right? You know, I guess if I had a squirt gun, I would have <laughs> I would have squirted it with a squirt gun. But I didn't even touch his feet. I just kind of splashed some water at him and the like. And then when it came time to dry his feet, you know, I don't know, I didn't know how to do it. I thought, you know, what do I do, make a little rat tail and just kind of snap it at it? Or, but what I ended up doing was I bobbed up the towel and I kind of just dabbed at the feet, right? I didn't hardly even touch them. I just kind of dabbed at it like a, like a rubber stamp, you know. And um, then he went and put on his own shoes and he put on his own socks. And... Uh, then it was my turn. So, as I reached down to take off my own shoes, he went and stopped me. And he went and he took my shoes off for me, one shoe at a time. And then when I went to reach for my socks, he stopped me again and he took my socks off and took them and folded them up, put them very neatly into the shoe. And then he lovingly and with great care placed my feet in the water and then massaged my feet. You know, you would have paid. $45 of massage envy for how good he did my feet, washing them very, very thoroughly. And then when the time came to dry my feet, he went and cradled my foot with a towel and gently he went between the toes and dried every square inch and did a wonderful job. And then he stopped me from putting my own socks and shoes on, insisted on doing it for me. So he put my socks on, then he put my shoes on, and then he shook my hand. Well. I really do believe God caused that whole situation to happen for my very first uh, Lord's Supper. And um, I felt like a total heel and a total idiot. I believe that, again, God purposely had put this man as my first experience for foot washing. And now after some more than 45 years of many feet wash, that first one sticks in my mind as an excellent example of love and service. There's something to be said about removing one's shoes and having a covenant, both with God and with each other. You know, the cultures of the Middle East, shoes are significant. I recall uh, when back in 2003 when the, the big statue of Saddam Hussein was toppled down. And if you remember what people did, the, uh, they took their shoes off and they started hitting the statue. 
They were hitting the bottom of their shoe. They're hitting the face with the statue and as it's being dragged through the, through the uh, streets. And later on, uh, uh, within a year or two, George Bush was visiting Iraq, and one of the reporters took off his shoe and he threw it at Bush as a, a sign of disrespect. So in the Middle East, shoes are important. Okay, it's a different culture and a different mindset, and it always has been. It may be lost on us that live in the Western uh, civilizations. You know, uh, in the Bible, there's times where it talks about covenant and taking off of shoes as well. When God called to Moses from the burning bush, the first thing God told him back in Exodus 3 verse 5 was, take your sandals off. And that was when? Right before the time of the Passover. Isn't that interesting? He has us take off our shoes and he had Moses take off his shoes. And then some 40 years later when God appeared to Joshua as the Israelites were going to besiege Jericho, which by the way was also at this time of year, at the Passover time. I, I don't have time tonight to prove that to you from the scriptures, but it's, it is evident. And that the uh, siege of Jericho occurred during the days of unleavened bread. The seven days they were marching around Jericho were the days of unleavened bread. But uh, he said, God told Joshua in verse, uh, Joshua 5, verse 15, he said, take off your sandals off your feet. So again, God's making a covenant, and God's telling people, Take off your shoes, just like he did with Moses there with, Jer uh, with um, uh, Joshua. And it appears that when God is interested in creating a covenant and a contract, he asks people to take off their shoes. And when we get together for the Lord's Supper, some call it the New Testament Passover, we are making a covenant and contract too, both with God and with each other. We're making a contract, a relationship. You know, the story of Ruth and Boaz, and that's a typology of Christ and the church. It's an interesting one. In the fourth chapter of Ruth, we read this. It says, Now was the manner in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and concerning changing, for to confirm all things, a man would pluck off his shoe, and he gave it to his neighbor as a testimony in Israel. Therefore the kinsman said to Boaz, Buy it for me. And so he went and he drew off his shoe. I guess the concept was, if, if, you, if you got somebody's shoe, you've been pretty intimate with them, right? I don't think you end up with somebody's shoe by accident. And it's pretty good evidence in court, if you will, that a transaction has been made. So that's how they did it. When a contract was made, shoes were taken off. And again, hey, we're making a contract of, at, with God and with each other at the communion service, the uh, Lord's Supper, when we're taking off our shoes with, for each other, with each other. Hey, let's take a look at foot washing in the New Testament. We know that Jesus washed the disciples' feet. And he made clear that the act of washing each other's feet was not just an exercise of personal hygiene. And although his disciples would not understand until later, Jesus spoke about becoming spiritually cleansed, which would happen through his shed blood and the death of uh, his death for the sins of humanity. And here's some lessons for us as Christ followers. What should we learn from this act of humility that Christ did of foot washing? Jesus himself called the primary lesson of foot washing in John 13, verse 13, he said, You call me teacher and Lord, and you so, say, Well, for so I am. And if I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash each other's feet. In other words, if Jesus is willing to humbly and unconditionally serve his followers a lowly human task, then those disciples should follow his example and be willing to perform even the most unpleasant tasks for the brethren and mankind. And that goes beyond just washing each other's feet. As human beings, there's times we're going to have to put up with some unpleasant things in service to one another. So Jesus instituted the foot washing ceremony to illustrate that he had come to serve mankind and that we too are to serve mankind. Christ's ultimate service mankind and his willingness to give his life for us, which was to happen that very next afternoon. His example of humility and service and great generosity is all the more stunning because of his contrast with the attitude of the rest of humanity in our natural ways. Do you realize that Jesus even washed the feet of Judas? And Jesus was full aware that 
Judas was going to be the one that was going to betray him unto this horrific death, unto this horrific thing of, of crucifixion and, and abuse. And yet Jesus washed this man's feet as well. Now our natural tendency is to look for ways to make others serve us. But God's way, on the other hand, is unpretentious in the willing service to others. So looking towards the conclusion here, you can do three things to help you understand and capture Jesus' attitude as he washed his disciples' feet. Point one, ask God to help you better understand and practice the spirit of foot washing. Point two, ask God to help you better understand and practice that spirit of foot washing. And point three, always be looking for ways to serve others, not just in the faith, but everywhere that you can. So each year as we approach this season, let us keep in mind the wonderful lesson of washing each other's feet and the sim symbolism of, of serving others with humility and without imposing any of our own conditions or rules. Jesus told us to emulate this. His actions can be summed up, summed up in a simple statement in John 13, verse 15. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done unto you. In the final day of Jesus' human life as a mortal 2,000 years ago, there was somewhat of a tug of war regarding Jesus' fate. This dispute was between the Romans and the Jewish leaders of his time. It was clear that the Roman procurator Pilate wanted the Jews to be in charge of killing Jesus while the Jewish leaders wanted the Romans to execute him. It's important to note that the Romans had to be the ones to execute Jesus rather than the Jews. Why is that? Wouldn't Jesus' death have been just as real and just as final no matter which of the two groups killed him? After all, either way Jesus would have died for our sins. Another point, Pilate had Jesus scourged. This act of Jesus being painfully humiliated was actually quite necessary. Why? At the Ronald L. Dart Evangelistic Association, we have a message that goes into detail about the importance of Jesus not just dying. This message shows how Jesus also had to suffer, both physically and mentally. The title of this message is, Discern the Lord's Body. You can find it on the audio recordings tab of our website, rldea.com. This message is free. Again, the title is Discern the Lord's Body at rldea.com. We'd like to begin our final uh, segment tonight, um, and what I'd like to do is talk about home Bible studies. Because home Bible studies can be a two-edged sword. Many good, t good things can come from a home Bible study, but many bad things can come from a home Bible study. When it comes to home Bible studies, there can be two extremes that we see. On one side, some churches simply don't allow them. They say that you can only study God's Word with a licensed minister from their organization, so they usually have no uh, corporate Bible studies uh, where people are doing it in their homes. They usually just do the corporate things in a rented hall or somewhere. And these corporate Bible studies many times are not really studies. They're just lectures with the minister droning on and on. These monologue Bible studies are no different than a boring sermon, and many people won't attend these, st these studies because they say, well, look, I already have to listen to a boring sermon at church on the Sabbath. Why do I need to listen to a boring sermon on a Wednesday night that's incorrectly labeled as a Bible study? And I know that I've sat through a ton of these quote-unquote Bible studies and I've cringed. That's on one side. On the other side, there are independent Christians who get together in somebody's living room and nobody has done any preparation. Nobody has actually prepared anything. And this is actually an act of vanity because these people actually feel that they are so knowledgeable about God's Word that there's no need to prepare anything. So when everyone shows up, Someone throws out a book and chapter, they start reading it line by line, and after that it's just blah, blah, blah. Again, no preparation. And while these folks believe that the Holy Spirit is guiding them through the evening, I don't think so. I think these assemblies, too many times, not always, but many times, are nothing more than a pooling of ignorance. Because in any teaching situation, 
whether it's theological or secular, there has to be some type of preparation beforehand. Again, not just by the leader of the group, because if you're going to have a home Bible study, every participant has a responsibility to do some preparation before you show up. And again, when people say, I don't need to prepare, I'm smart enough, that's a point of vanity. Now, we get criticism all the time about how we prepare for this show. People tell me, they say, you over-prepare. And maybe I do. And Nancy and Bill do the same thing that I do for this show. We've got our stuff together usually by Monday night. About 90 to 95 percent of the show is done by Monday night. And then we keep going through this process of honing our material, refining it. We're trying to make it as accurate and qualitative as we can. And, and someone in that case would say, well, you know, to you, this is a point of insecurity. Maybe not a point of vanity, but a, a point of insecurity. And I'm not going to argue that because we see SOS as a sobering opportunity to promote God, His Son, our Savior, and His written word. We don't take this show lightly. We feel we have a sobering responsibility to not get up here in front of the cameras and be unprepared. So what, what, when the day comes that I've got to answer to God for what I teach, no doubt he's going to get on me for the mistakes I've made because I don't have perfect understanding when it comes to Scripture. But I want to make sure that I never get in trouble with God for being so casual or for being flippant in my preparation for talking about Bible topics. All right, let's get back to these overly casual home Bible studies. If there is no proper preparation or proper discipline for a, a home Bible study, this environment becomes fertile ground for every crackpot idea and every goofy doctrine under the sun. These overly casual free-for-alls are the epitome of the admonition that we get in Ephesians 4.14. Write that down, please. Ephesians 4.14 that tells us, don't be blown about by every wind of doctrine. And I've sat through many of these studies and home Bible studies and cringed as I watched people get blown about by every wind of doctrine. And, and now let's get to the really important point of this segment. The big problem with these pooling of ignorance studies is this. Too many times, someone will read a verse out of Scripture and they'll ask the question, what does this Scripture mean to you? And when this happens, too many times, this is a mistake. Now here's where somebody out there right now is going to get mad and say, well, wait a minute. If I can't talk about what a Scripture means to me, then that's wrong. We've got to be able to discuss what a scripture means to me. And the person's correct. It's good when we look at a part of the Bible and talk about how we relate to this passage. But before we can do that, we have got to answer the following question first. What was the writer's intent? What is the writer trying to tell us? What is the writer trying to get across to us? Because until we answer those questions, we have no business trying to talk about, quote unquote, what this scripture means to me. May I say that again? Until we first understand the writer's intent, we have no business talking about what this scripture means to me. Now, you don't agree with me? Let's, let's have some fun. Let's check this out. Let's take this passage that I love to talk about a lot. You've heard me discuss it. It's in the King James, and let's read it and talk about how if the reader doesn't understand the writer's intent, the participant in the Bible study is going to get way off and be, end up being where he has no business being. Let's read Acts 12.4 from the King James Version of the Bible, Acts 12.4. And again, I'm going to read from the King James because... King James is the most popular translation in evangelical circles. Okay? Acts 12, 4, and the King James says, And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quaternarians of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Now, let's pretend that this verse acts 12 4 has just been read in some small group bible study in the home of some evangelical christians and i guarantee that this has happened in some bible studies on numerous occasions 
taking this verse all by itself in a vacuum, out of context, with no understanding of the writer's intent, when they do that, many Christians are going to see the word Easter and they're going to say things like this. First, they're going to say, Ah, oh, Easter, I love Easter. Easter is the time when we get to hide eggs for our kids on Sunday morning. Or they say this, Easter is one of the two most important times of year for Christians. We have Christmas in the winter and we have Easter in the spring. Or, number three, maybe they'll say something like this, you know, we have, a, 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 and I say this because we end up having a Christian who knows a little more about the Bible than most do, and he knows that this verse in King James regarding Easter is, is really kind of problematic. So he might say something like this. I really appreciate that Easter is actually mentioned in God's Word. Now, some of you know already where we're going with this. Some of you, uh, though, are going to be surprised. And i got to tell you, all three of these statements that I just made may sound really nice, but every one of them is totally and completely bogus. Now, why do we say that? Because again, if you're going to talk about what a verse means to you, you've got to start with understanding what the writer is intending the reader to get. Again, if you don't start with that understanding, you're going to end up in a place where you have no business being. Let's look at what the writer of Acts is talking about when he wrote what we today call Acts 12.4. Acts chapter 12 is a historical recounting of how King Herod is persecuting the church. Acts 12 tells us that at this point in history, he has already killed the apostles James and John. Verse 3 tells us that Herod has been arrested by the apostle Peter. And then when we get to verse 4, we see that Herod is going to deliver Peter to the people. Now, when is Herod going to deliver Peter to the people? Well, it's quite clear. In the King James, it says after Easter. Isn't that right? Question. Is the intent of the writer of Acts to tell us that after Easter, Herod is going to deliver Peter up to the people. Absolutely not. Now, some of you are saying, oh, why can you say that? It says it right there in the King James Bible. And, and as difficult as it may be for you to understand, I'm telling you that the King James Version should not have used the word Easter in this passage in Acts 12.4. The original writer, the Greek writer of the book of Acts, we think it was uh, Luke the physician, the original writer did not use the word Easter, he used the Greek word Pasha, P-A-S-C-H-A, Pasha, write that down, P-A-S-H-A, I'm sorry, P-A-S-C-H-A, and Pasha in the Greek language can never mean Easter, it can only mean Passover. And if you look at any other English version of the Bible, it always, always, always says Passover in Acts 12 for even the, uh, the, the um, uh, Catholic version of the Bible. None of these versions ever translates that word Pasha into Easter. The King James is the only translation that uses that word Easter in Acts 12 for, and the King James is wrong. The word Easter is nowhere to be found in the New Testament just like the word Christmas. The writers of the New Testament never used words like Christmas and Easter. So let's back up. Let's ask the question. What was the intent of the writer of Acts when he wrote what we call today Acts 12.4? His intent in this particular verse is to relate the events surrounding the deaths of John and James and the imprisonment of Peter and what was going to the intent of Herod to do with Peter. That was his intent. It's important to understand clearly that if the writer of Acts was not, I'm sorry, let me say that again. It's important to clearly understand that the writer of Acts was not a guy who would keep a day named after a pagan goddess, which is what Easter is. That's not what the first century church leaders were all about. These guys had nothing to do with pagan practices. So when Christians read Acts 12, 4, and then they go off on good feelings regarding Easter, they're wasting their time. That's not having a real Bible study. 
They're not understanding God's word, at least that particular passage. They're not improving their walk with Christ. They're just going off on some emotional trip based on ignorance of what the writer's in original intent was. Again, if you want to talk about a particular verse, what it means to you in a home Bible study, that's great. But you can't do it until you first determine the intent of the writer. Now, some of you are going to say that I'm being too harsh in my assessment of what Bible study is all about, and that's fine. And, and tonight, I'm not going to pick on just the evangelical Christians. I'm sorry to say that too many times, Sabbath-keeping Christians do the exact same thing. A Sabbath-keeping person or a Sabbath-keeping minister or a Sabbath-keeping church organization many times will come up with some doctrine that's based on a verse in the Bible where they, have no, they either have no idea what the writer of the passage is talking about or they couldn't care less about understanding what the writer of the passage is talking about. They're only interested in promoting some doctrine of their church. These people, again, have no idea what the writer's trying to get across. They don't care. And yet they still come up with some half-baked doctrine based on how they feel about that scripture or based on how it will help their church organization promote themselves to new converts. As hard as it may be for you to accept, in many of the big church organizations out there, if you have a question about a Bible verse, it's not the job of the minister to determine the original intent of the writer. It's not the job of a guy who's on their payroll. His job, get this, is to promote the party line. It's his job to say whatever he needs to perpetuate the doctrines of his organization. Because whenever he finds that the writer's original intent goes against the teachings of his church organization, there's no way that he's going to talk about the writer's original intent. And now here's where I have to be careful because I can lose some of you at this point if I haven't lost you already. In other words, all these folks that we're talking about, whether we're talking about the evangelicals or the Sabbath keepers, too many times these people don't understand the concept of hermeneutics. Ugh, hermeneutics. Someone's saying, oh, Wes just threw another one of these Greek words at us. And some of you are saying, I'm out of here. I don't want to know that much about the Bible. Please don't be intimidated by this word hermeneutics, H-E-R-M-E-N-E-U-T-I-C-S. It's not a complicated word, it's just a word, and it can be very helpful to us in our walk with Christ. Now, what is hermeneutics? Now, first, let's talk about what hermeneutics is not, okay? Hermeneutics is not the study of Hermann Munster, all right? And I got to get this out of the way right off the bat because I know someone's going to be making jokes in the chat room about hermeneutics being the study of Herman Munster. No, it's not that. Okay. Here's another bad association that some church people have with the word hermeneutics. Years ago, many of us knew a really smart minister named Dr. Stavronides, and I knew him personally. I liked him a lot. Really nice guy. Very pleasant guy, very knowledgeable guy. And years ago, he and I were on the faculty together at Ambassador College. But he would drone on and on for so long about hermeneutics, and no one understood what he was talking about. And his big deal was hermeneutics, and he gave hermeneutics a bad name. So today, when many people hear the word hermeneutics, they think about Dr. Stavronini's just droning on and on about something that they couldn't understand. We shouldn't think bad things about the word hermeneutics. Hermeneutics is good. Let's understand this, okay? Hermeneutics is a two-part word. The first part of the word hermeneutics comes from the word Hermes. And who was Hermes? Hermes was a pagan Greek god. His Roman name was Mercury. His pagan Greek name was Hermes. Hermes was the messenger of the gods. And whenever the Romans wanted to send a message to humans, they would have Hermes carry that message. Again, Hermes delivered the words of the gods to humans. This, so that's the first part of the word hermeneutics, comes from Hermes, the, the message from the gods. The second part of the word hermeneutics has to do with rules. So hermeneutic, hermeneutics is simply the rules that are used to figure out what God is saying through the writers of the Bible. It's that simple. 
This shouldn't intimidate us. Now, here's the problem that comes in with theology today. Let's talk about the single meaning philosophy about the Bible. On one hand, we have the atheistic and agnostic theologians that tell us there's only one meaning to each verse of the Bible, and they say that we're really not going to understand any meaning of any verse because too much time has elapsed between the writing of those guys back then and our reading it today. They say that our understanding of a language few, a few thousand years ago, they say our understanding is not sufficient enough to understand these original words that give us the original intent. The atheistic and agnostic uh, theologians tell us that the culture in which the writer back then composed this passage, they say he's long vanished. And they say that sure, the descendants of his culture live today, but they say even those descendants have no idea what the culture was like a thousand years, a few thousand years ago. So how are you going to know what uh, the, the culture is all about? So the atheistic and agnostic theologians are basically throwing up their hands and saying, this Bible stuff can be nice to read, but we can't put too much stock into it because we're too ignorant of the author, too ignorant of the environment, we're too ignorant of the language to know its single meaning. And we don't agree with that. That's on one hand. Okay, on the other hand, we have a lot of fundamentalist theologians who agree that each verse has only one meaning, but then they say, we can always know that meaning. No matter what the verse is, we should be able to know that meaning. And here's their reasoning. They say, why would God give us his written word if we weren't able to comprehend it? We don't agree with that approach either. Now, let's talk about this concept of single meaning. When we say single meaning, do we acknowledge that the writer can be using a word that has a double meaning? Again, single meaning of the verse while having a word that can have a double meaning. Can you see the difference? Let's talk about double meanings of words. Yes, a word can have more than one meaning, no matter what time frame we're looking at in human history. Here's an example. Teenage boys love this concept of double meanings in words because they can take a word in our English language. It's a perfectly clean word. You can use this word in mixed company, but then that same word can have a second meaning to teenage boys, a second meaning which is a vulgar meaning. And teenage boys love to use these words to see how far they can go to get away with talking dirty without getting in trouble. And I could give you a whole list of words, but it would be in poor taste for me to do it on the show. So in the history of man, there have always been words that have had double meanings. Today, we have Christian theologians who say that a scripture can have a surface meaning, a spiritual meaning, and an allegorical meaning. They say that the Bible is like an onion where if we keep peeling back the layers, we are going to discover more and more meanings to a verse. And if this onion theory is correct, then that means that understanding the Bible is really a difficult process, isn't it? And, and I don't agree that it is. I don't think that understanding is a difficult process. I don't think that a person has to be a rocket scientist. I don't think he's got to be uh, fluent in Greek and, and Hebrew and Aramaic in order to understand the Bible. But if their onion theory is correct, then what happened to the simplicity of the gospel message? I think it's there. I think they're making too much out of all these different kind of meanings. I don't go along with this onion theory where supposedly there's a surface meaning, a spiritual meaning, and an allegorical meaning. The meaning that the Bible writer is trying to give us is basically straightforward. He has a single meaning. There's just a plain meaning in the passage. Now, don't get mad because let me, let me qualify that in a minute. But there's a single meaning of every passage. Once we understand that, and once we've done our hermeneutic step in examining the scripture to find out the original intent, then we can look at different, many multitude applications of the meaning. Do you see the difference? Let me say that again. After the hermeneutic step, which is to understand the, the, the uh, intent of the writer, after the hermeneutic step, the application of the verse in our daily lives 
can and should begin and there can be many applications. You see the difference? Am I making sense? Write to me in the chat room if I'm not clear. Write to me if you don't agree with me. I want to hear if you have a disagreement. All right. Back to our acknowledgement that words can have double meanings. Double meanings in words happen all the time in writing all throughout man's history. It happens a lot. Let me give you a real quick secular example. All right. And don't let me scare you. I want, I want to quote some Shakespeare. I know a lot of you have had to endure classes in Shakespeare in high school and college. I did. In Shakespeare's play, Henry IV, the Earl of Worcester says the following. He says, and tis no little reason bids us speed. In other words, we've got to hurry. To save our heads by raising a head. When Shakespeare used this word raise in this passage, the word raise has two meanings. Number one, raise the current king's head on a pike. In other words, what they're talking about is killing the current king, cutting off his head, and putting it on a pike and parading it around so everybody could see the king is dead. That's raising a king's head. Second, it can also mean to raise up their buddy to then become king after they've killed the old king. In other words, raise him above the kingdom. So there are two meanings to the word raise when Shakespeare is talking about raising a head in this particular play. Yet the passage itself has a single meaning. All right, that's enough of Shakespeare. Probably bored you to death. Let's move on. Again, this type of, this type of word, word, uh, play on words, it's done all throughout the history of man in every language, all through history. And the Bible does the same thing. Here's what I think is the most classical biblical example of double meanings, of a word having two meanings in a verse, but the verse only has one meaning. Let's talk about Jesus' encounter with Nicodemus. We find this in John 3, 1, where Jesus says to Nicodemus, John chapter 3, verse 1, write that down. Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born. Now, what's the word he uses? I'm going to give you the Greek word, anothen, A-N-O-T-H-E-N, anothen, okay? This Greek word, anothen, has two meanings. It can be anew or again. And if this is correct, if this is what Jesus meant, again or anew, then the correct translation of this verse would be very truly, I say to you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born again. But if the word anothen means from above, which it can in Greek, then the translation should be like this. Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above question which one did Jesus mean did he mean born again or born from above or did he mean both I think Jesus meant both in this passage I believe Jesus is telling us this very truly I tell you no one can see the kingdom of God without being born again and from being born from above in my opinion, I don't think there's any translation out there that uses, they all use one or the other. And I don't think they're correct in, when they pick either born again or born again. I think that this verse should be translated very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born again and being born from above. And again, disagree with me. Talk to us in the chat room. But that's, that's from my study, that's what I believe. All right, let's get back to our protest that there should be simplicity in the gospel message. Yes, I believe there is simplicity in the gospel message. I, I promote that all the time. But as we grow in grace and knowledge in our Bible study, let's not oversimplify the gospel message by turning it into our own personal interpretation of what was written by a man of God several thousand years ago. And while we acknowledge that there can be many applications of this single meaning, there can be no application whatsoever until we have the single meaning of the writer. And here's a pivotal point, and I tell you this all the time. We've got to acknowledge that we're not always able to divine that single meaning of every verse of the Bible. We have to accept that we can't figure this out in every verse of the Bible, why not? Because 1 Corinthians 13, 12, 
write that down. 1 Corinthians 13, 12 says that we see through a glass darkly. So I don't think we always get it right. We will when Jesus returns, but for now, we're not always going to get it right. All right, back to our problem regarding the lack of proper hermeneutics in the churches. Too many churches try to put the application of a scripture at the front of the process in Bible study when the application of a scripture belongs in the back of the process. And one last thought, please keep uh, in mind that hermeneutics, and we can talk about this more some other time, maybe we will, maybe we won't. Hermeneutics is both an art and a science. All right, now we've just opened a whole new door. All right, I bored you enough with this tonight, but we're not quite done yet. We still got to look uh, at, at hermeneutics some more, not, not tonight. But what I want to do is look at some examples of how proper hermeneutics is ignored. And, and um, these are the things we want to look at next time. If you want to write them down, read them yourself. Matthew uh, 7, 1, Matthew chapter 7, 1. We also want to look at, uh, what's our next one? Matthew chapter 5, verse 39. Matthew 5, 39. We're going to look at this next time. Matthew 18, 20. Matthew chapter 18, verse 20. We're going to talk about that next time. And one more, which is, if I can pull it forward, Philippians 4, 13. Philippians chapter 4, 13. So we're going to talk about those next time because people have got these really whacked out views of those four verses. And you hear, and these are not some obscure verses. These verses are, are spouted off all the time by Christians. So let's look at them next time. In the meantime, read them for yourself. And before we go to the chat room, we want to um, uh, uh, do a reminder for you, and that is this. At Dynamic Christian Ministries, at the Ronald L. Dart Evangelistic Association, uh, at uh, SOS, we never ever ask you for money. And we still, to this day, even though we say that, we still get money from people. And every time we send it back, no exceptions. We've never kept any contributions to Ronald L. Dart Evangelistic Association, Dynamic Christian Ministries, SOS. Never will on our <coughs> policy. We don't want your money. We want your prayers. Please pray for this show. Please pray that God will guide and direct us. And if we're bad, pray that God will punish us. Because I know every night we have people out there who watch the show and get mad because they can't stand it. I get that. And you're welcome. We're glad you're here. I don't want God to punish us. Well, if we're bad, I want him to punish us. But I Maybe don't, just gently correct gently, us and show yeah, us the right, right. way. But, but if, if you think we're that bad and that evil, please pray for yeah. us. If you love us and think we're doing a pretty good job, please pray for us. Either way, pray for us. And if you're getting any value out of this show, please hit the share button. Hit, you've got that share button on your Facebook page, hit the share button. Uh, or if you're not watching on Facebook, copy the link uh, for the, tonight's show and uh, paste it. And, um, uh, oh, okay, we're going to bring Nancy in. Oh, thank you, thank you. Um, and, and copy and paste it and send it out to people. Because if you're getting something out of this show, other people can get something too. If you hate this show and you're not getting anything out of it, don't share it. Okay. If you think it's hilarious and your friends need a laugh, share it with them. Yeah, if you want to make fun of us, go ahead and share it. That, we, we don't mind. Okay, uh, so we're going to look at those four scriptures next time. Oh, let me know, hitting the table. Is it bothering us now, now that we've got the microphone separated from the table? Can I go back to hitting the table without it <laughs> making this boom, boom, boom? He sound? loves to hit the table. While you answer that question in the chat room, are we ready to go to the Yes, room? go ahead, sweetheart. Uh, John Black said, uh, the instances in scripture where foot washing is mentioned, water is provided for individuals to wash their own feet. Even servants did not do it. Christ did something even lower than a servant's job. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So he's saying that if you went to somebody's house and, and you needed your feet washed because you were walking and your feet were dirty, the servant would bring the water, but the servant didn't actually do the foot washing. You're expected to do, do it yourself because they didn't expect, I think that's what he's saying. Correct me, John, if I've got this wrong. And I didn't, I didn't know this. This is new for me. He's saying the servant wasn't expected to do it, but then Jesus comes along and guess what? He does it. He's, he's going even lower than a servant, and that's the ultimate humility, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Good. All right. I, I, I'm sure that John knows what he's talking about. Thank you, John. That's an interesting point. What Lee, else you got? Lee Lisman said, the foot washing at the Lord's Supper is a church tradition that is not practiced by all groups. That's right. true. Not everybody true. does it. We should stress the importance of an attitude of service to the brethren the other 364 days of the year. That's true, too. 
Also, years ago, I attended the Lord's Supper service, more like a mass over, uh, where the two officiating ministers only watched each other's feet, missing the point of what Jesus was trying to tell us. That's interesting. That's yeah. interesting. Yeah. Uh, Robert Giovi said I attended a Bible study with six other baptized people, and the Bible study was very edifying to all who attended. Good. And they can be. They should yes, be. Yes, they should be. Praise yeah. God. But Rod Kuzman had said, uh, oh, not him, um... Bill Brad said, I appreciate your preparation, ours for the program. Thank you, Bill. Yeah. Okay. All right. And then um, people ask for a starter Sabbath cup. Sorry, folks, there's only two in production, and these are them. They're asking, oh, for the cups. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, Bill Brad says, Acts 12, 4, we always need to be more than the, or need more than the King James translation with all other translations. Uh, have it correct. Pasha is Passover and not Easter, and I think you mentioned that too. That other translations have it condemned. Yeah, Bill. That was Bill Bratt. Bill Bratt. Yes. Yeah, Bill brings up an excellent point. Um, you should never rely on just one translation of the Bible. Never, because no Bible translation is perfect. The Bible we feel is God's inspired word. It's perfect, mm -hmm. but it's and we feel that it's been accurately preserved. Like. 99.99 percent and i think we did a study on that some time ago about talking about the old testament about how the scribes and the Masorites and they mm -hmm. they, they mm -hmm. were computer like in there when they would we copy did. the one from one copy of the scripture to the next generation of copies and and they weren't in any way shape or form careless all right that's a whole different topic but as far as um the translations that we have out there, they are not perfect. None of them are perfect. So you got to use other translations. And, excuse me, now, and it used to be you had to buy a bunch of Bible translations or you had to go to the library to find translations to look this stuff up. And, and I'm old school and I've got a whole bunch of Bible translations and anymore, I don't even open them anymore. I've got the Bible translations on the internet. Right, right. I go to um, blueletterbible.org exactly. and there's, or Bible a, dozen, Bible. there's a dozen different yeah, things. And I flip back and forth and I yeah. can hit the Strong's and get the Strong's Concordance right. and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And, and if I want to uh, uh, preach a sermon at Church God Seventh Day and, and I know they're going to translate it in Spanish, all i got to do is click a button and the verse I'm reading, it'll give me the Spanish. I can copy it and paste it and put it in a document and give it to my translator. And, I mean, it's what God has given us with this technology is marvelous. It's amazing. Let's use it to our advantage. Go to the, the Internet and look up uh, Blue Letter Bible, Bible Hub. Look up different translations. They're out there for you. They're free. There's no charge for them. Right. Uh, Robert Giovi said, I, I had a conversation with a Hebrew scholar, and he said Christians do not read the Old Testament with a Hebrew perspective. Exactly. He pretty much said we're ignorant of the Hebrew language. Well, you always say that. The Bible is not a Western it is not. book. It is, it is an not. Eastern book. And it's an Eastern think. book. And, and again, Nancy and I have been, we were just talking today about this, or was it yesterday, about I still want to go to Vietnam mm -hmm. to preach the gospel, and I may. And and when I, if I get to go there, God willing, and I get to go, what and I talk to people about the Bible, what I'm going to say is don't listen to what the American churches are teaching you. Because they have taken Christianity and they've made it into a Western religion. And I'm going to say to these people in Vietnam, you are Asiatics. The Bible is an Asian book. It is not a European book. It's not a Protestant book. It's not a Catholic book. It's not an American book. Not a European book. Not an English book. It is an Asian book. Look at the Bible as an Asian book. And, and that's just uh, one more way to help you to get the writer's original intent. Absolutely. Now, who said that? Giovanni? Robert uh, Giovanni? Yes. Thank you, Robert. Excellent okay. comment. Um, I want to take a moment to say hello and welcome to Debbie Libby. She, she said this is our first time watching. Welcome, she Debbie. Enjoyed it. We yeah. hope you'll come back. Yeah. Uh, and somebody put BibleBlueLetter.org on there. BlueLetterBible.org. Oh, yeah. That is correct, Priscilla. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, thank it's you. A great, somebody gave it to me a long time ago, and it is great. 
um, really enjoy it. And like I said, all these things at your fingertips is really yep. good. And it's all free. And they have an app, so you can have it on your phone as well as on your desktop. And I use it a lot. And it don't cost nothing. Praise God. Right. That's true. They do take Praise donations, God. though, if you want to do a donation. Okay. If you want to. Uh, Willow Love Al says, uh, sunrise service was condemned in the Old Testament. And Priscilla Hawkins says, we have no need to observe a sunrise service for any anything. And you mentioned yes. that. Mm -hmm. uh, Bill Lucenhide said wor the words estrogen, astarte, asteroid are all related to the word Easter and are interchangeable with Venus. <laughs> right. Uh, Willow Love Al also mentions that Skip Martin has an online Bible study with Go to Meeting, so you can check him out if you're looking for another one. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Rod Kuzman says, We need more than a thousand scripture sermons. We need more <laughs> thousand scripture sermons. Not. <laughs> or you could say he said no one ever. He yeah, said no <laughs> one ever. Scripture race sermons, yeah. we call them. Uh, uh, yeah. And let me, let me, who, who said that? Uh, Rod Kuzman. Kuzman. Okay. Thank you, Rod. That's an excellent point. And, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quote from Ron Dart right now. And Ron Dart, he always discouraged guys who gave sermons from having a scripture race, where you race from scripture to scripture to scripture. And Ron Dart said, it's, it, you're better off to concentrate on fewer scriptures, and then when you get to a scripture, you don't have to say something about it and then run off. Mm -hmm. Let's drill down to that scripture. Mm -hmm. Let's. He didn't say this, but I'm going to put this, these words in his mouth. Try to get the writer's intent. Try Instead of quoting this scripture and then running off somewhere, use less scriptures and then concentrate more on those scriptures. So, who, again, who said that? Rod Kuzman? Mm -hmm. Yeah, real good point. Thank you, Rod. Okay, um, Bill Brad asked about uh, getting an article on the Quarto Decimin controversy, and I told him to check out Kelly McDonald. <laughs> oh, yeah, Kelly's got all kinds of stuff yep. on that, doesn't yep, he? Yeah, he does. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Rod also says that there are plenty of people who want to talk about whether Passover is on the 14th or 15th, and yes, that has been debate, debated in home Bible studies for a long time and in regular church services. Yeah, and, and um, I gave a sermon on that, and um, it's, it's probably too late the now. 14th or the 15th? Yeah, Passover, 14, Passover or Seder or Lord's Supper, 14th or 15th. And, and about how there are so many different ways to look at this, and that doesn't even take the, the calendar equation into, into play. Mm -hmm. Let's forget that there are all these many, many, many different calendars. Let's ignore the calendar. So if we, even if we agree on the calendar, we still can't agree on the date of, uh, we can't agree on what to call it, Lord's Supper, Passover, Seder, and then we can't agree on 14th or 15th. Mm -hmm. And even when we agree that it's the 14th or the 15th, we can't agree on why. That's how, how much uh, disagreement there is out there on the subject of the Passover Lord's Supper. Um, people are asking if you're giving a sermon tomorrow. Uh, I saw no. several people say, is there a sermon tomorrow? No. And I was like, uh, what are you asking? Then I realized, oh, they think that you might be giving an afternoon sermon tomorrow, but it's not. there's not one till April, right? I think so, and I'm sorry it just worked out that way. That um, We skipped the one, or we, we, something I, happened. I got sick. Oh, yeah, you were and, sick. And, and, so we're just I, skipping it. So we're just skipping it, but we are going to uh, get this started back up in April. Maybe I can try to give two in April. When I was, we'll when I was first baptized, um, I was a college I, I think freshman it's the first at Sabbath Indiana in April University. That we scheduled. I don't have my calendar. No, time I was the first Sabbath in April, I'm preaching at Church God's Seventh Day. And I'm not giving two sermons in one day. So oh. I think it'll well, be... Well, I think I just wrote down West Sermon and didn't say what Yeah, you didn't say where. <laughs> church got seven I think it'll be the second Sabbath in April, I think. Okay, mm -hmm. second Sabbath in April. So, um, okay. we'll so look at we need, we need to for sure maybe post it in the comments later yeah. when you look, uh, yeah. when, when you see it later, and also start promoting it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so, so people know. Yes. Okay, Willow Love Al points out that Jesus was asked why he spoke in parables, and some people might be surprised at his answer. That's right, because he did not say to make things clearer, which is right. what a lot of people teach. That's not what he said. Right. Yeah, he, he, he says, people say, oh, well, Jesus wanted to make things clearer, so he used these simplified parables. That's not what Jesus said why he did it. He did it to hide the meaning because he didn't want everybody to get it right there and then. So, yeah, you know, Willow Love Al is absolutely right. Uh, Bill Bratt wants to know if Ron Dart ever did a sermon on the Quarto Decimin or Dicemin, however you say it, controversy. Quarto Decimin controversy. Okay, I said that way too. That's an excellent question. Uh, you can go to uh, check out rldea.com and see if there's one 
in Ron's audio messages, and if not, you can go to uh, CEM and mm -hmm. see if there's one over there. Mm -hmm. Eventually, RLDEA.com will have one up there because we want to post as much of his stuff as we can. And we've only been in existence, we've only had our website up for, I think, seven months now, eight, we're going on eight months, and we have such a backlog of material to get posted, mm -hmm. but we mm -hmm. are really going to give it a full court press and get everything up there that we can. So we're we're working on that. A year from now, I'm pretty sure we're going to have one, but for now, because um, I'm sure Ron talked about it, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm sure. Um, Bill said, Lucenhide said, it, hitting the table's okay so that's something that'll make you happy you can go thank you bill like this that's how we that's how, how we hurt my knuckles it. yeah that's why they're all swollen okay um okay willow love also says uh the dead sea tablet was almost a perfect translation of the mm. book of isaiah bill lucenhide said the dead sea scrolls are almost exactly like the scriptures today on um, the text found dating from before christ mm-hmm and uh, Charles Roberts says there's always something <coughs> lost in translation. Absolutely. There's always something lost in translation. Absolutely. Bill, I mean, Lee Lisman says besides the four passages for us to look at next week, you could also consider another scripture, 3 John 1, 2. Churches have promulgated an entire gospel of health and wealth based on misapplication of this passage. Mm -hmm. Yeah. See, we've got something here. Kelly, uh, somebody says, does Kelly McDonald have a web page? Uh, Bill posted one for him. Oh, he did? Yeah. I don't, I just have, I'm connected. Oh, yes. Okay, he did. Yeah. Okay, never mind. Yeah, it's on, it's it's on there. Bill did it. Thank you, Bill. Um, as always, I'm a day late and a dollar short. Okay, so I should probably read some comments from YouTube. Oh, yeah, let's go to YouTube. Al Bundy 59 says the King James Version... King James, Ver, um, King James Version doesn't always translate the Sabbath properly. It waters it down to yes. a rest in a couple of places. Yes. And as a week instead of, or as Sabbath. Yes, sabbatismo, that, that Greek word that killed the King James guys. They couldn't understand the Greek word sabbatismo. Okay, okay. good point. Who said that, Bundy? Uh, yeah, Al, Al Bundy. Thank you, okay. Al. Good comment. Um, Paul, oh, Carl Nottrieb says, uh, My Sword is a good Bible app, very similar to That's e right. Sword. I forgot about My Sword, yeah. Thank you, and Carl. And it's free, but you can purchase a deluxe version. Yes, okay, okay. very good. I didn't know that. Um, Paul Shaw says, E Sword is a good... Um, PC program and app, and my sword is a good Bible app. Okay, so he's yeah. talking about the same thing. Good, thank you, Paul. Um, and oh, uh, Ron has a sermon on various on various variations of when to take the Passover. Excellent. So. Okay, that's in. A, is there any way, Carl? Can you cut and paste that? It, what do they have? A YouTube uh, link in there? Well, that was that was Carl uh, saying his dynamic Christian ministry. Oh, it's so. a DCM. Yeah. Okay. So there, there's a link. YouTube, okay. So. Carl, can you take it out of uh, YouTube and put it in Facebook so everybody can see oh, it yeah. in Facebook? Oh, yeah. Can you put the link, link yeah. there? Yeah. Thank you, Carl. Excellent. Okay. We do have something on that. Okay. Um, oh, and Will Love Al mentions that Kelly McDonald will be on uh, Bots. Bots next week. Yes. So I forgot mm -hmm. that. Okay. And then Paul Shaw says CM has posted a Passover service led by Ron Dart if anyone needs one. That's right. And I think uh, CGI has a Passover service that. Maybe they still have the one you did. Maybe um, not. That, that they might, they might not. Yeah. But uh, that is a good way if you can't get to it live or you don't have a good enough internet connection. Yeah, and the problem with going with a live one is that if you're in a different time zone, you you might be keeping the Passover Lord's Supper at the wrong time. So if you can get a pre-recorded one and do it at the right time, that's the best way to do it. I mean, if you're in the same time zone, obviously do it live with them on, online. Um, Paul Shaw asked about SOS being on Roku, and I had to say, not yet. It'll be a little while in the future if we do mm -hmm. that. Um, and he, Paul also mentions that Judas had already left before the foot washing um, yes. account in, as it laid out in John's. So. Yes. Okay. All right, and I see that we've got the YouTube posted here, so that's good. Thank you, Carl. Uh, I think we're probably winding down, so would we want to close this down? It's about uh, 25 after 9 now. Okay. Once again, we want to thank you so much for being with us. As always, Nancy and I, we had a ball. We hope you had at least a little bit of fun. There's no way that you can have as much fun as Nancy and I have, and we're so sorry. We we're, have a ball when we do this show. I'm so glad you joined us for it. And we're, we're so, so glad, glad that, that you uh, joined, joined us. us. And um, please come back. Um, we're scheduled to be here next week, aren't That's we? That's true. Do you know what you're talking about? 
Uh, yeah, four scriptures. I already told oh, you. Oh, those, those. That's, yeah, we're going to okay. talk about that next time. Okay. And uh, and I'm not going to use the word hermeneutics um, anymore because I think it turned off a lot of people. Oh, really? <laughs> we'll just talk about the misapplication. Right. But those of you watching tonight, you'll know <laughs> that the four scriptures we're talking about, we're doing it from a hermeneutics point of view, but we're not going to use that nasty word. So just don't tell the other viewers, okay? Yeah, don't tell anybody else we're using the, that we're using hermeneutics and yes. you won't say it. Yeah. I'm hoping that I will talk about faith versus religion. Faith versus religion. Bill, you got about uh, 20 seconds. Can you tell us in the chat room what you're going to be talking about? And make sure you post it in Facebook and YouTube, please. And if we had Roku, the Roku people would be able to see this stuff. So, But we got to get go. Roku. Paul Shaw is right. We've got to get uh, Roku correct. Up then we will days. expand as we can. Yeah. Um, so, uh, okay, so there's a Passover service posted here. Great. Uh, Marion Young Perkins says, hope everyone has have a very inspired, restful Sabbath. Thank you, Marion, and we hope you do too. Um, I don't see anything from Bill. Maybe he went to get some decaf coffee or something. I don't know. But um, so uh, he can post it later, or it'll just be a mystery. Okay. All right? Let's close with prayer. Let's do it. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much that we were able to study your word, and we ask that you please uh, guide and direct our minds, guide and direct our hearts as we try to better understand you. And we understand that there are some limitations to our understanding what uh, your inspired, inspired writers wrote uh, thousands of years ago, but we believe that we can understand these things if we put our hearts and our minds into it. Help us to utilize your Holy Spirit Help us to utilize these tools, these wonderful, marvelous tools that we have at our disposal that others for generations did not have. So we thank you for these blessings. Ask for you to be with us as we continue a better, to better understand your word. Now, please put your blessing on those who will be traveling to church tomorrow. Please give them your travel mercies. Please keep them safe. And please help them to have wonderful uh, assemblies with your people, your obedient ones, your ecclesia, around the world. We give you praise and thanks, and we ask all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Have a good Sabbath. Uh, we'll see you next week, same time, same bat channel. And right. um, have a good, good Sabbath. Sabbath. Wow. That was fun.